Secretary's Service interacts with family law. Um, we hear amount of experience dealing with military cases representing both service members and spouses of service members. Um, and it doesn't extend just to active duty members, it's also veterans and the uh, way that the law plays into uh, those who have served in the past. So one issue that we kind of want to touch base on is the Service Member Civil Relief Act. And uh, Fizzy, how does that go into protecting active duty soldiers? So in terms of the procedure here, in North Carolina actions, whenever we initiate a claim, we file what's called an SCRA affidavit, which is a Service Member's Civil Relief Act affidavit. Um, you use the military's own website to verify if someone is in active duty service, and it gives active duty service members certain protections. Um, for example, it precludes a default being entered against an active duty service member without them having an attorney appointed to them. Also, if a service member is deployed or if they are um, stationed elsewhere and their military service is precluding them from participating in the litigation, it grants them certain protections in the form of a stay, um, so long as they take certain steps like getting letters from their commander to do so. So it just kind of, among other things, in the realm of family law, gives them some protections um, once they get into litigation and the litigation process. Okay. Um, another issue that comes up is sometimes there's some lag between a couple separating and um, getting into court. So if you're in the military, your spouse is in the military, what kind of support do you get from the government or the military itself? So a lot of times, particularly here in Wake County, our docket is very crowded and um, we have a, you know, a delay between when we can file for litigation and when you might actually get heard. So in those cases, there are military regulations that are mirrored across the different branches of service um, about what a service member is supposed to provide for their dependents um, absent a court order or other written agreement for support. Um, essentially, based on the number of dependents you have, the what your BAH is, which is basically your basic allowance for housing, um, and, and what your situation is as it pertains to your custody of your children, how many um, children you have that are under the order, how many dependents you have that are you have an obligation to, to support. It's going to um, affect the amount of support that is due to the dependents under these regulations. Um, typically though, however, if the service member is the one to leave and the spouse and the dependents are still residing on base, that on-base housing is going to take the place of the support that might be paid under these regulations. Um, so these are all important considerations and often the best way to get assistance with this is either to contact an attorney that can kind of help you through negotiating the numbers and looking at the numbers to figure out exactly what amount might be due to you under these regulations. And so then if you end up in court or you reach an agreement with a separation agreement or some other kind of consent order, what happens at so, that point? Um, at that point, the regulation is no longer in place. Um, and the court order or written agreement, such as a separation agreement, um, would supersede that regulation. But something that's unique for um, dependents of service members is that defense, finance, and accounting service, um, they can garnish the amount of support up to certain limits directly from the service member's pay. Um, so you can submit the court order, whether it be for alimony, whether it be for child support, um, and you can submit that to the Defense Finance and Accounting Service, and they can take that directly out of the service member's pay. Um, it typically ranges, uh, there is a cap on the amount that can be garnished, um, and that goes between 50 to 65% of the disposable income, which 
It depends on if you have arrears, if there's multiple support orders, if you have other children and dependents that are not covered under the order. But this is a really good avenue for um, both the service member because it can take the obligation off of them to make the payments directly and also for the dependents to ensure that these payments are being processed and made in a timely manner. On um, the subject of support and calculating support, um, something that's important to know about military family law and support specifically is that there's often a misnomer. It, it, it comes up a lot with military service members, veterans, um, Perhaps they're not retired from the military, but they have a VA compensation, or they have a military disability retirement rather than based on longevity. In those cases, there's a misnomer out there that, you know, well, you can't touch my VA pay. Um, but it's important to note that, in fact, all your income is attributable for the purpose of calculating support. And it's important that that misnomer gets cleared up. Just not for your property division, but when it comes to child support, every dollar you have coming in. That's exactly goes out. right. That's exactly right. Now, another thing that North Carolina has implemented, I think you told me 10 states have yeah, done this so 10 far, states. is the Uniform Deployed Custody and Visitation Act. Can you tell us what that is? Yeah, so I mean, this is a, a really great thing to have. We have a large military population here in North Carolina. Um, with the numerous branches of services and their bases. So it's um, definitely been adopted here in 10 other states. It essentially um, sets, where, sets forth a framework that allows um, a service member to delegate their custodial time and rights to a third party in the event that they're deployed. Um, and deployments can take a, a, a big toll on families, whether they're still intact or whether, you know, it, it, they're separate. And one thing that you don't want is to lose contact with your child when you're deployed. It's hard enough as it is already. So this allows you um, to delegate someone to step in your place. And you have to take certain steps for this to apply, such as giving notice of your um, pending deployment um, and allows you to nom nominate someone that has a close and substantial relationship or an adult family member. Often it's a new spouse or a grandparent that's going to you know, take that place. Okay. Um, the thing that comes up probably most often in divorce, property division cases when it comes to military um, active duty and veterans is the pension. Um, we have to find a way to divide that up. How is that done here? So military pension division is um, one of the most complicated family law matters that there is. Um, there's so many different steps that need to be undertaken. There's uh, dozens of documents that need to be disclosed because the rules vary so greatly based on if someone is still serving at the time the pension is divided, um, depending on if they are receiving this VA compensation, disability retirement. Um, so kind of the first step in dividing the military pension, and often one of the trickiest steps is getting all of the documents. Um, a lot of them can be obtained by the service member directly, but particularly in service members who have been retired, they don't have those documents anymore. And so you really have to go and do Freedom of Information Act requests to get these documents. Um, so again, first step, get the documents. Here in North Carolina, um, if you are going to litigate, as with any other claims um, for equitable distribution, there's various steps that you have to take um, that you can kind of tell people about the steps in dividing property. Yeah, so the main the main focus for dividing your property is what is marital, what is separate. Marital property is anything you got from the day you got married until the day you separated. When it comes to the military and the pension, 
you have to look at a second step of that, which is how much of your marriage was during the service. Um, if your spouse was already in the military when you married and they're still in the military when you separate, you've not been there for 100% of that service. Um, so you have to look at a different formula at that point. And um, there have been some recent changes to how we do that here in North Carolina, at least. Um, and one of those is the frozen benefit rule. Yeah. Tell us about that. So the, the frozen benefit rule here in North Carolina, typically um, we apply the coverture fraction, which is how many years of service accrued during the marriage, how many total years of service were earned by the service member that are creditable towards retirement. Again, this goes back to what I was saying earlier about getting all of those documents. Um, you might have someone that's in the National Guard. They're not a standard um, active duty service member. So they're accruing points that are creditable towards retirement. That makes it even more tricky to compute well, which is what portion is marital, what portion is not. Um, so North Carolina marital fraction, coverture fraction. But there's been a, a recent change and they do this frozen benefit rule. I also have referred to it as like a snapshot or a, a hypothetical award, which basically um, it freezes it as of the date of separation. So Defense Finance and Accounting Service um, is not going to process a pension division order that doesn't comply with these certain requirements. They are only going to apply a portion of the service member's retirement um, as of their hypothetical retired pay at the date of separation and their years of creditable service at date of separation or their years of credible reserve points. So what this is doing is freezing the award that defense finance is going to pay to the former spouse. They're freezing it as of that date of separation. In years past, um, particularly here in North Carolina, you might separate and your service member spouse continues to get years of service, continues to grow in rank. And while your percentage is kind of set or is going to decrease based on the fraction and the, the years of service continuing, you would benefit from the work that is put in after the separation with their years of service increasing in their rank. And what Defense Finance and Accounting Service did and the federal government did is they've changed the law so that it freezes at date of separation. Now this federal law is in contrast to the law here in North Carolina and it just makes the negotiation and litigation of this issue, you know, more complicated and more unique than, you know, what we would face in a traditional pension division um, or retirement division with with someone in the private sector. All right, and Fizzy's mentioned documents a lot um, when it comes to the military pension, but the most important one is the DD-214. That's the document that a service member receives when they retire. If you are a service member or you're a spouse of a service member, make sure you have that document. It'll save a lot of time and a lot of effort and a lot of attorney's fees um, to get the process started if you have that. Um, but there is also one other part of uh, military service that um, goes into property division and that's the survivor benefit plan. Yeah this is um, often forgotten um, and again going back to the unique regulations that apply with family law um, the survivor benefit plan allows for the pension to continue to um, one of the service members survivors in the course of family law, it's often going to be the former spouse. Um, there is a premium associated with this benefit, depending on what type of retirement it is, if it's an active duty or reserve retirement, those premiums can vary. But most importantly, there's very strict guidelines and deadlines for the paperwork that has to be submitted to ensure the continuity of the survivor benefit plan, and you know the time frame that those documents need to be submitted. Um, so if you have a case that involves survivor benefit plan, pension division, military, family law matters, 
Um, it's really important that you're aware of all of these and that you speak to someone that can adequately advise you about the different um, issues and different deadlines and regulations, documents that are going to be out there and that are going to be necessary to make sure you're really fully informed. And that's a really, um, it's a, it has a lot of value to it, the survivor benefit plan. Yeah, yeah definitely. Definitely has a lot of value um, with life expectancies increasing. Um, you know, can be valued in excess of hundreds of thousands of dollars. Um, also, it's really important when you're um, separating and looking at your future to ensure your financial stability for the for your future. And you know, that is something that can certainly provide it. Okay. All right. Do we have any questions tonight? No, we do have somebody that commented and said, "Good job, Busy." All right. <laughs> Thank you. All right, guys. That's all we have for tonight. We'll see you next time. Have a good night.